Welcome, Rick. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Very, yeah. very exciting times today. Yeah. So how excited are you to release two feature films or thrillers, right? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, a, this is an anthology of three films. And so we had the first film come out a couple months ago. Uh, the second film, uh, which is called Death of an Author, Dear Agnes coming out today and Samaria was supposed to come out in September. But due to the pandemic, they pulled it up to release on the same day as Dear Agnes. So as of today, now all three films are, are available. Yes, and on Video On Demand and Apple TV on all platforms. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of a, a pay-per-view system almost, you know, wherever you go rent a movie. Yeah, so it's, um, I watched both your films and it's very suspenseful. It's, you know, it just kept me on my toes, if you will. And I love the the uh, narration at the beginning and it was yeah so that is it's a consistent thread right to each film like they have the integral cafe i know yeah yeah there's definitely connective tissue i mean they are standalone feature films uh there's there's a lot of easter eggs i mean one of the, the thrilling aspect for us is to be able to make both films and now all three available at the same time because we hope an audience will you know watch them close in close proximity because you'll find easter eggs and there's crossover characters there's there's crossover locations uh and the more you know we, we hope people will find those elements to see the connective tissue across all three yes and what was the feedback or what is the feedback from death of an author um the first one that came out yeah the feedback's been good i think a lot of a lot of the fan base was looking to see the other films so that they can maybe identify those elements so we've always spoken of and uh you know the first film you know all all three of these films were shot across the balkans and in, in serbia slovenia and croatia and then in belgium as well and so you know you'll see every each film also has some locations that cross over and we moved around a lot uh, to make all three of these so you made it look easy you went from one one country to another country yeah so the filming is spectacular though. And um, so tell us about um, how closely related it is to the book. Yeah, so first of all, Death of an Author is fairly close to the book. Uh, Dear Agnes, and the book was called Rain, R-E-I-N. Uh, and Dear Agnes was actually a series of love letters between Agnes and Henny. That's, that's the book. Dear Agnes, so there's a bit of a creative license and uh, you know manipulation to kind of make it into a screenplay, but it also fit tonally what we were trying to accomplish for Intriga. So that was the next one. Uh, Samaria is actually almost a combination of two books: a short story and another book, and that made up the uh, like Paula Polanski was not a character that existed in Samaria originally, and so that was a that makes up the five stories that are inside the Intrigo publication. And when you get the Intrigo book, the, the fourth major story, I should say, is the, the next film that we're going to be shooting in the fall. So it's, uh, that, that's, you know, the book is now available, of course, as well as Intrigo as one. You know, tell us about the filming, like the process, like how involved was it? Like, did it take two years, like to make it and, and uh, like? Yeah, it, it was a long, a long procedure. I mean, we, uh, I was shooting in, in Serbia on another film in um, 2016, I guess. And Daniel Alfredson, the writer, writer director of Intrigo, who I had worked with previously on the Anthony Hopkins film called Blackway, he had reached out to me to say, Hey, you know, I have these, these scripts that are based on a book. I'd like you to take a look at them. I had read them while in Serbia and invited him down to Serbia and said, look, I think we could shoot these here. And if not here, in the region. And so that was probably a, a six, eight month process of scouting across a lot of Eastern Europe. We looked at Macedonia, we looked at Montenegro, uh, we looked at parts of Albania, uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, as to whether, you know, where we could make this fictitious country. And if it was one city that stood out, then it, it would, be a disservice to the film because then an audience would say, oh, that's Berlin or that's Prague. 
we needed to fake it. And so you needed to m mash up these countries to create our fictitious country. And so after a six to eight month process of identifying, okay, now, now we can make it here and where we would base and we based out of Belgrade with our, our production team we worked with previously. Uh, well, that was, you know, and then from there, it's a six month window to now put everything in place to cast it, to go back into Belgrade, set up shop, and then we shot for 10 months. And then it was another year of post-production and now they're coming out. So it's a two, three year process on this film, maybe longer, I guess, um, from inception. And, and how involved was the author working with you? So Haka Nesser was, was very involved from the start. Uh, the first process was Daniel Alfredson presenting these three stories to Haka Nesser to say, look, I think this is something that could be published as one book and all tonally be as one film. And so he's a funny guy and a, and a wonderful writer, obviously, and, and kind of chuckled at the, the aspects of doing that. And Daniel and Dita, uh, the writers, of course, co-wrote this, they uh, convinced them and they wrote the scripts. And there's a funny story of the first adaptation. They actually read the scripts to him personally, rather than him reading it. <laughs> And he was amused by that. He loved it. And he's been a big partner of ours since the beginning. He, in fact, came to the set in Belgrade and in Belgium and was so excited, went back and wrote a fourth story that we later, that is now published inside Intrigo. So, so the three films that we had made were published in different, uh, at different times in different languages, but never in English. And so now you have three stories published in English plus a fourth story because he was so involved and felt part of it and was involved all through post-production. So very much a, a partner of ours. Unlike, you know, a lot of times when you acquire the rights from an author, they may not want to be that involved. But in this case, he was very involved. Yeah, so what do you want people to get from the film? Yeah, I mean, I think what, what the takeaways are is that, as Hakan Nesser writes, is that uh, everything, to get this quote right, everything is not is as it seems. And a lot of people around you and in your lives all have, you know, there are hidden stories and hidden, hidden lives in there. I mean, I had a, a meeting this morning with a director that may be part of this saying that how many people he knows that, you know, that the son that they have, they've never disclosed to the son that that is not the father and all these interwoven family secrets and mysteries that they are all around us and that never to not uh, tur you know, turn your back to that stuff. And so in these films is that you start to learn that you can't trust where that character is going in their arc. You can't trust the storyline because you're waiting for that twist to come up about with it. And uh, you'll see that, you know, obviously as you see all three films, that's the theme across all three. Yes, and Rick, how do you maintain your stamina? How do you producing in general or during a lockdown? Uh, in general, like I mean, how do you you know maintain a healthy lifestyle? Well, you know, from a business standpoint, I I'm motivated and inspired by logistical challenges and and uh, complexities. I find that when you make a film that is uh, you know let's call it a simple production in one location and four or five actors. After doing something like Intrigo, I started to really identify that because of how complex that was and a massive undertaking is that personally, that's something uh, that I like that it inspires me every day is to come up with new initiatives and new ways to innovate in this industry. Uh, from a health perspective, I mean, I, I think like a lot of us, you know, as filmmakers, you're doing, 18 hours a day. I play hockey three times a week. I train six days a week. That probably keeps my stress levels low. I think most people around me and actors I work with know that no one's ever seen me sweat on a film set, even though the entire world could be coming to an end, but you'll never see me sweat. Uh, and I think it's my mental focus. It comes from uh, hockey and maybe training hard, you know? That's great. And like, when did your idea or when did your passion begin for movie making? How did you always want to be a filmmaker? Yeah, I've been fortunate enough that uh, I've always 
I think in my yearbook from high school, it says, where will you be in 10 years? And it said, I'll be in Hollywood making movies. And uh, I think I beat that actually by four years or five years because I actually was in the business right out of high school. Uh, I've actually, I've actually, I grew up as a child actor and that was my passion early on until I realized where my strengths actually lied. And it was probably behind the camera than in front of the camera. And I've always liked working with people and, you know, a very goal oriented person as well. So when you go to make a film, you have your script and that's all you have. And you're going to have to add a hundred ingredients to it, meaning your crew. And you're going to have to add 20 cast members that you don't know who they are. You're going to meet everybody for the first time. You tell this story, you take it through post and you take it to the market and it's done. That's like you, you've actually nailed the goal and you're on to the next project. And so there's something that's always kind of, been inside me i think about setting a, a goal like that and you can accomplish it and move on and you continuously do that so it's always motivating in life to, to continue that i think i've always wanted to be a filmmaker from the beginning for that reason i think wow who influenced you w were you any any influences for you like any role models or? yeah i mean i think i had a lot of um you know i i Grew up in a small town in Canada, and uh, I was always, you know, I, I had work ethic that was instilled in me very young by my father. And I think you combine that with whether it be technology. We had a film program in our high school that was a late entry into the school system to get a film program. And so nobody really knew how to work the equipment. And uh, I, I ran with it and just started making short films. and seeing the medium that, that you could use. I always you know, say that in this business, we have the ability to make the biggest impact on the most amount of people in the world, in, in pop culture, ultimately. It's harder to impact a grander scale of people if you're, you don't have that outlet and that this medium of filmmaking, ultimately. So I recognize that early that a camera can tell a story and that story can translate in Uruguay or Indonesia or, or Russia. Uh, so combining that with initially doing stage work as an actor, I was a huge fan of a lot of the old classic actors. Like I was a big Charlie Chaplin fan. And so that nostalgia of storytelling combined with the medium that I now can control, whether anybody sees your movie or not, is a different story. But I think that was, um, you know, and I've had a few teachers along the way that, that constantly encouraged this process, even though it was, it was new and unique to that area to have a filmmaker. I mean, it was never something like, you're gonna go off to Hollywood and be successful. And it was never, it was still the doctor, lawyer, maybe be a dentist. It was so foreign to have this ability. And even this, you know, we're talking years ago before Canada really had a thriving film business. It was not something where now, if you grow up in that small town, I talked to kids in that region saying, go to Vancouver, you know, go to Toronto. You're, there's a thriving business there. You, you can do it, no problem. You know, whereas when I came through there, there was this tiny little show that had just started shooting there called Xbox. And that's what launched the Vancouver industry, basically. So there wasn't the opportunity back then. It was definitely foreign. Um, but a uh, few, you know, the work ethic and the drive is certainly something that pushed me along the way. Well, you are a role model for many and oh, very kind of you yes and, and what is next for you rick i mean with COVID 19 um what's what um well we're we're very much keeping our finger on the pulse we've been doing a lot of interviews globally to to really figure out what is the next chapter of filmmaking and the film industry won't look the same much like the rest of the world and a lot of different industries and so we've been exploring how do you go into production when do you go into production what, what types of films will we be making, both from a storyline perspective and a logistical perspective? You're not, if anyone's out there developing a pandemic movie or a pandemic series, because they were, and their people are, but no one's gonna wanna see that because we're living that. So it's gotta be escapism. You're gonna see a resurgence of comedies and 80s John Hughes comedies and period pieces. Those are, those are subject matters that we all need to be making. Um, how do we make them? You obviously, I'm sure you're like the headlines, gatherings of 50 or more is probably gonna be the most difficult. So you're not making House of Cards, you're not making the Avengers movies. Those are not happening soon. 
And so, you know, we're, we're working out a model that all can be done uh, both with smaller groups, smaller cast, and maybe this is a resurgence of the independent filmmaking spirit because it requires innovation and it requires us to rethink the unnecessary excess on a film set. And we're there to make a movie, not to provide services for the production crew. So do we really need the lunch buffet to be as big as it used to be? <laughs> no. Um, so I think you're gonna see, you know, this will be a massive wave of innovation in our business, uh, how to come out of it and, and make, you know, different films in a different way, in a different fashion. We need entertainment. We need entertainment. We need movies yeah. to escape and, and you know, it changes and, and you are a role model and you're inspiring. So there, there is a way. Um, well, one of the things with our business that's always been interesting is the entertainment business has always been recession proof, right? You hit a recession, people can't go on vacation, but they'll take the family and they'll go to the movie theater once a month and they'll buy popcorn and make an outing for the family. So we can be recession proof, but now we're learning, we're not really pandemic proof because you're seeing production companies, distributors, theaters going bankrupt and closing their doors and they may not have a future when their lights come on. So sadly we're seeing that. Uh, but we also know that during this time, people are watching more content than ever. So it requires people like us to still provide the content. We just need to figure out you know, how to, how to do content quicker because now you're gonna have this lull when the lights come on that there was a four or six month window where nothing was made. So where are we 12 months from now when you're trying to go to the theater when the theater's open? There's nothing fresh because not only did the studios pull their releases up from the summer up to now, so you can see it while we're at home, but you're gonna have this hole in the marketplace uh, as to what's available. So it's this tricky thing of, you know, we might be recession proof, but we're not pandemic proof. And uh, while we still need to make the content. So it's a trying time, certainly in our business too. Yes. And and you know congratulations on the opening of the two feature films and if people want more information where can they go rick you know our, our website is is mostly up to date it's, we keep that fresh but also our social media is more uh, so the website is enderbyentertainment.com we have our social media pages that uh i believe um are well, enderby entertainment is the facebook page there's also a producer page myself that i, I try to help out and mentor film students as much as I can. So that's accessible and they can reach me that way. And there's also on my Instagram under Rick Dugdale as well, uh, trying to do a lot of outreach, especially during this time to help motivate some filmmakers for the future and make sure that they have the resources they need to continue to be inspired. So social media is definitely where we can uh, keep track of everyone and keep in contact. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Rick? No, I think that's it. I think we covered everything. I'm just uh, excited for, for the world to see all three movies at once and then, and then check back with us and ask questions. That's where <coughs> myself and the director were discussing that this morning is be anxious to see if people who have watched all three to say, wait a second, the girl that opened the door in Death of an Author was this woman from Samari. You know, we're anxious to see how that all starts to come together, you know. Yes, that's wonderful. And, you know, thank you again for your time and I'll be in touch. So Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Rick. Okay. All right. Now. Take care. Too.